steel construction jobs in the civil engineering department during 1934-35 was the project known as Railroad Avenue Seawall Improvement. The scope of work consisted of approximately 6,800 feet of seawall, an embankment fill of over 300,000 cubic yards, water mains, sewers, paving, and so forth. The limits of the project extended from Bay Street on the north to Madison Street on the south along the Seattle waterfront. The scenes you are viewing are in the vicinity of what is now Pier 55 and Pier 56 between Seneca and University Streets. According to the engineer's report, Many studies had been made of both temporary and permanent development. Both types were considered, but since preliminary cost estimates on a permanent plan ran into enormous amounts of money, the work was postponed time and again. A design was finally worked out that combined the permanent features with the use of timber and wood of the more temporary type. Since the cost of this plan was far below the lowest possible of the more standard types of seawall, and adjudged to be permanent, it was adopted and used for the project. Railroad Avenue was a street which varied in width from 140 to 180 feet. It was carried largely on timber trestles. It had become more and more inadequate. Large sections of the street had been blocked off and closed or limited to light loads. Both vehicular roadways and steam railway trackage along the waterfront occupied the street and considerable confusion was the result. In January 1934, the city of Seattle undertook this improvement by the use of day labor, following the failure on six different occasions to receive acceptable general contract bids. From time to time during the course of work, various individual contracts were awarded for such work as pile driving, manufacture of wall slabs, premixed concrete and backfill material, all other work by city employees. It was said in 1934 that if the Board of Public Works had not at the start of work by Monday, January 15th, the city would have forfeited $400,000 in state funds. Here is the installation of the 20-inch water main and valve at the intersection of University Streets. The water main runs north and south in Railroad Avenue and is in existence today. The first unit of the project to get underway was the driving of piling. The Manson Construction and Engineering Company became the successful bidder and they moved two pile driving units on the job. Both units were to operate four shifts a day for a full year. A third outfit was brought in to drive sheet piling, and it was planned to work this rig two shifts daily for one year. Special pile driving equipment was brought in to drive the batter piles. This is quite a remarkable shot of the cutoffs on the piling. Of special interest was the utilization of the tide for placing of the heavy 60 foot 12 by 18 shear caps. They were hauled from the framing yard to the water and unloaded there. They were then floated into approximate position at high tide. As the tide receded, the caps were lowered into exact position and secured. Since it was impossible to drive the piling in precise alignment, the city inspector and surveyor had to take the measurements of the cutoffs on the piling each day. These measurements were transferred to the shear caps so that the cutouts would match each individual piling. This heavy duty dado machine was set up in the framing yard on the project. This was the machine that made the cutouts in the shear caps. All of the work done in the framing yard was by day labor. The timbers were purchased through the city purchasing department. The 
contract for the manufacture of the precast walls was awarded to the General Construction Company of Seattle. These are typical scenes taken at their plant on West Marginal Way during the preparation of forms, placing of reinforcement steel, and so forth. There were two types of walls, and they were called A wall and B wall. The A wall was used in the areas that did not require sheet piling and extended approximately five feet below the relieving platform. The B wall was designed to rest on steel girders on top of the sheet piling. Both types of walls were designed to perform the same requirements. This combination of sheet piling, concrete wall, and timber relieving platform was not a new design, having been successfully constructed for many years in European ports. It must be remembered that the seawall design was a compromise plan, combining concrete, steel, wood, and aggregate backfill. The main features of this design were the use of precast concrete slabs for the wall, which removed the necessity of expensive coffer dams. Sheet piling cut off below the slabs to protect the fill, timber piling foundation and relieving platform to carry the weight of the fill and prevent settlement into the soft bottom of the shoreline. Authorities seem to agree that sheet piling kept constantly wet in seawater was permanent. Also that piling and lumber buried in a fill and kept constantly wet could not be attacked by marine life or any form of rot or decay. Thus, the combination of concrete, steel, and untreated wood were considered to be as permanent as any recognized type of permanent construction. Special heavy-duty cranes were brought in to load the slabs at the yard and set them in place on the project. Their transportation to the site and their installation became of great interest to West Coast engineers and contractors, since this was one of the first projects in the country which utilized this type of construction. Articles were published in the trade magazines describing the various units of the project and the design of the various structures involved. The contract for the concrete seawall involved the production of four of these slabs daily for one year or more. They were eight feet by 20 feet in dimension and weighed approximately 23 tons. Each slab was numbered in numeric order cataloged and placed in proper sequence, and they were loaded in the same order. The reason for this was that the shear beams had to fit the spacing of the piling in the relieving platform. One would assume that the tongue and groove slabs would slide easily into place. However, much difficulty was experienced until someone suggested the use of form oil to relieve the friction. Due to much of this work being at or below extreme water level, only a few tides each month were suitable for efficient work. It was decided to use a diver and work all tides. This was found to be very costly and inefficient. It was then concluded to get everything in readiness, put on a very large crew for this low work whenever a low tide occurred. The men worked in the water and it was found that the job could be done faster and better at about one-fifth the cost.
These men are preparing an area to receive the wall slabs. This is one of the locations where sheet piling was placed. The area behind the piling has been stabilized with backfill, and the B-wall slabs will rest on the I-beams, which are the caps for the sheet piling. This is reinforcing steel protruding from the top of the wall slab, which will help form the cantilever sidewalk to be constructed later. Here we can see the wall slabs in place and the method by which the slabs were secured. You will note that the concrete shear beams are keyed. Concrete will be placed between them to form a solid slab. One inch steel rods were used as tiebacks to keep the wall in absolute vertical position. Concrete vibrators had not been in use many years, and an interesting sidelight here was that a reporter for one of the newspapers became so fascinated with this operation, he wrote a feature story on vibrating concrete at the seawall. The contract for furnishing ready-mix concrete was awarded to the Crosby Sand and Gravel Company. They were located on East Lake Avenue on the south side of Lake Union. They later became Pioneer Sand and Gravel. Their contract was for furnishing the concrete at the job site only. Placing it was by city day labor forces. The problem of keeping vehicular, rail, and pedestrian traffic operating at all times, both on the street and dock, cost many thousands of dollars to handle, and added months of time to the date of completion. But all the source of aggregate backfill for the project was the mouth of the Cedar River at the south end of Lake Washington near Renton. Barges were loaded by clam derricks and towed north through the ship canal and the government locks around to the job site. At the job site, the backfill was transferred to loading hoppers and hauled by truck to the embankment area. It was a very coarse aggregate, and although it did not require compaction, it was sluiced into the fill.
This is a portion of the completed wall. The seepage is from the water used to sluice the embankment down behind. This is a portion of the underside of the cantilever sidewalk. and a portion of the sidewalk being constructed. The hand railing for the sidewalk was precast in the framing yard on the job site and constructed in place. For the record, Mr. M. O. Siliason, city engineer, Mr. O. A. Piper, principal assistant, and Mr. Clark Eldridge, bridge engineer, were in direct charge of the improvement. In addition to the seawall, $91,000 in water mains and $40,000 in sewers were constructed. Total cost of the improvement was $1,600,000. These cylinders were tested under load to a pressure of 2,000 pounds per square inch. And so ends this chapter in the history of the Alaskan Way seawall.